afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can I thank you for attending the meeting today? Um, it's good to see so many of you coming out on a wet day. You know it's about planning, and I'm particularly grateful to Stephen O'Brien to accommodating um, very quickly following my email from the last parish council meeting, um, an hour's time for Audlem. Um, the focus is on Stephen today, no pressure, um, and we do only have an hour. So I look forward to receiving your, uh, to receiving your questions shortly after Stephen's made a few comments as well. In the interest of correctness, before proceedings start as a whole, I will remind that I have declared an interest in relation to the Gladman application in Audlem. Therefore, any matters planning will be generalised. I will not speak of a site individually. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think, uh, without any question of it, at 2 p.m. on a Friday, in pouring wet weather, to have, I would guess, about 100 of you here, is itself the biggest testament of how deeply concerned you are about the appropriateness of what is currently uh, in front of us as a community. Uh, the Audlem, as I've always uh, been very proud to both represent and indeed uh, advocate, is really at the, the very top of what it is to be a community. And I think everything we are going to discuss to, uh, this evening, or rather this afternoon, uh, is really about what is appropriate for Audlem the people, Audlem the community, what is going to continue to make this particular uh, community uh, tick in the way it always has, in a very good, cohesive, uh, and well-structured and well-served way. So really, that's where I start from. Uh, clearly, the uh, issues of planning, of what is required, both in the national interest, where we are in terms of broad provision, uh, what it is in terms of opportunity for those who have the sensitivity uh, for our communities, as against simply uh, the numbers on a piece of paper, uh, that is what we're going to discuss and try and get the, the balance. Particularly as your Member of Parliament, my job is to try and be your representative, your voice, as to what it is you want to get heard at the national level. I recognise that in planning matters, the ultimate power, the authority, is actually the local authority. It is uh, Rachel and her colleagues as the councillors, they are the ones who in the end come each application, make the decision, unless it's appealed, in which case it goes off to the next stage. The issue for me as the Member of Parliament, apart from the fact that on many planning issues I will be approached by constituents, and remember constituents both for and against each application, and so I have to make sure their voice is heard, their representations are heard, and make sure that they're engaged in what is a democratic process. At the moment, there is a feeling of disconnection between the sense of your power as people in the democratic process and what seems to be happening in terms of decisions for various applications. And so that's where, in Parliament, there has to be a series of guidelines, a series of policies, and, of course, the background law. And that has changed recently, and there is both a simplification of planning rules, there is a new process towards where the influence of local people takes effect in planning, and there is, of course, the drive by the government, uh, the coalition government, of which I'm not a member, I hasten to add. I have been a minister in the past, I'm not a minister now. I happen to have a particular envoy job, which is a personal appointment by the Prime Minister, which relates to uh, trying to defeat some of the enemies of the state in North and West Africa. So it could not be more removed, if you like, from the particular issues of, of order. So I have no personal uh, conflict of interest of any kind. And in particular, as the MP, I hasten to add, it's my job to represent two governments, even if it's of the same party. And so where we have issues that government is in charge of, that is where, as an MP, my job is to make sure your voice is heard with them. But I have to obviously remind you that I'm not actually answering for the government today. I'm simply making sure I hear what you've got to say and where I can help. I will certainly make sure your voice is heard. So really, I think the best thing we can do is to make sure I'm listening to you and getting your questions and doing my best to answer them. And if there are absolutely masses of them in the room, then we'll take the questions in groups. But let's see how we go and, uh, and who wants to make their various observations. OK, Jeff. Yeah, an extract from the Conservative Manifesto on which uh, Mr O'Brien was elected 
The planning system is vital for a strong economy, for an attractive and sustainable environment, and for a su successful democracy. A Conservative government will introduce a new open source planning system. This will mean that people in each neighbourhood will be able to specify what kind of development they want to see in their area. That's the first one. The second one, uh, significant local projects like new housing estates will have to be designed through a collaborative process that has involved the neighbourhood. Um, I'd just like to know how uh, that stands against what is happening now uh, and uh, how you will ensure that what you were elected on uh, you will carry out. Well, thank you very much indeed for the question. And indeed, it's absolutely right that uh, we as politicians should be held to account for what we're elected on. Um, I, of course, I don't need to remind you, or indeed anybody in the room, that uh, to my eternal regret, we do not have a Conservative government. We have a coalition government of Conservatives and Liberal Democrats. And much as you may not wish to hear this, the manifestos were completely put to one side and a negotiated coalition agreement is what governs this government. So, in that sense, it would be lovely. I'd love to be uh, being held to account, as you shake your head, on the Conservative Manifesto. Unfortunately, you all decided not to give any one party power. You wanted a coalition, and that's how you... Uh, so, the answer to this is don't make, don't make this party political because you'd be on the wrong horse. This is about what rights you have as local people to influence the way your community develops. And so I would be really disappointed if we set off this meeting with some kind of party political attack. That would be the wrong way to handle the community's interest in Audlem and my responsibility to your MP, representing everybody who voted for me, against me, or not at all. Excuse me, can I still believe in the manifesto? Can, hold I, on a I, second. Well, individuals still believe in that manifesto? I absolutely do. I just wish we could implement it through a government that was a wholly Conservative government, but you did not elect a wholly Conservative government. Sorry, if I could just come back. I, I, that was not And I absolutely, uh, and I start from the point of view of not wanting to be in an antagonistic situation because this is not about party politics. This is about your rights as individuals in a community. And I do fundamentally believe what was written in the manifesto. Absolutely, I do. And what then happened through the coalition agreement was the implementation of a thing called the Localism Act. The Localism Act had a specific procedure whereby... Once local plans were put in place by each of you as communities and went through the statutory timetable of referenda to get those endorsed, in effect, that set out the challenge, which once the housing demand numbers had been agreed for a broad area locally and what each community therefore had to shoulder the burden for new housing. In other words, Yordam, just like every other community in both the Cheshire West area and the Cheshire East areas that I represent, once the broad numbers have been decided, then each community would have to shoulder their burden. No one community was, de was absolutely determined not to be a nimby about it. You all recognise you will have to have some area for some new houses around Audlem. And then at that point, that was going to be put out to a referendum. And once you've got the referendum, that became highly influential because it had been approved by the Department for Communities and Local Government. And as a result of which, that would then guide all the applicants as to where it would be likely that they would be able to succeed in getting an application going. And, of course, it would deter all those speculative, rapacious ones who are trying to rush in at the moment. But we have a particular problem in Cheshire, both east and west, because, as you well know, over my dead body, we had the collapse of Cheshire and the six borough councils. And we ended up having imposed upon us these two unitaries. That caused a massive delay and loss of corporate knowledge for the communities in terms of the local plans. So both Cheshire West and Cheshire East have been battling against the delay, where back in 2004, obviously under a previous government, because both Cheshire East, but particularly Cheshire West, had been over-providing houses, they had imposed on them a moratorium. That moratorium was then stopped in 2006. It takes about 18 months to two years. 
for planning applications to come through the system, as you know. So just in 2008, when the market fell out of bed, the applications were coming forward and, they weren't, and the builders didn't want to build back in 2008. And so we had, because of an oversupply, ironically, in our area, a moratorium imposed by the then government, and then under provision, according to the latest figures, which it takes time to catch up. And the current problem we face in Cheshire East is despite having had a plan with a view to a five-year housing supply, which is what you have to satisfy, it's been decided on a basis which has been now determined at court that the, the methodology which was used is one where the alternative has to be found, not the one that Cheshire East used, as a result of which there is now going to be uh, a need to find more houses and to some degree back to the drawing board, which is deeply disturbing. I'm as distressed as anybody else about it. But the whole point about the Localism Act was to give expression to that point in the Conservative Manifesto. As it happens, it wasn't that different to some of the other manifestos either. And the Localism Act was meant to do that. Why in Cheshire are we not benefiting from that? It's because we've got this two-year pent-up delay, which is all back to the unitary creations. If we hadn't had the unitaries, you'd have had a referendum because you'd have had time to do a local plan here in Audlem, and it'd be pretty clear whether or not the current applications were on land that you, the community, had decided is the best place to put houses over a five to ten year view. And that is where you're not because of those delays in getting that done. And that, in a sense, is for the reason... You know, we can't... It is what it is. We can't change that. But it is a real problem because, at the moment, there is a window for applicants to come in before you've had the chance to take advantage of what the Localism Act, which is the expression to that promise in the manifesto, uh, is given law to. So there you are. That's, that's the answer to your question. I personally do thoroughly believe, totally believe, in what the manifesto said at the last election about engaging local people, making sure they're influential. Not, not the final decision. You can't have a veto on these things. There is a constituent uh, stakeholder group that has to come to the decision. But ultimately, there should be appropriate, proportionate development in each community, and there should be the influence of local people who best know where it would be best placed and where the service and infrastructure is going to be able to cope. We already have pressure on schools and others increasing now because of uh, the number of applications to come forward. And just across the way, but in the other authority compared to yourselves, Tatton Hall is the most advanced in where we've got to. Uh, they've had a terrible problem with about seven applications coming at them, huge applications, and they have had a referendum, it's been very successful, they've got their plan, and now the developers are trying to take them to court to try and say they shouldn't have had the referendum. I mean, we are up against the most uh, challenging context uh, of, uh, of people who do see this as a real opportunity. And there's, uh, there are people in the northeast, there are people in Cheshire, and there are people in the southwest who are subject to these particular pressures because of the imposition of the unitaries, which have caused everybody to have these delays. Can I ask you that? Why is it that uh, we're here in Shropshire? Um, they thought their local government plan together a full year ago weren't being told by the local authority here in Cheshire East. So it'll be a further year before they have their planning plan. And we've heard from Councillor Bailey many, many times on the excuse of the administration and how it goes back to the change to Cheshire East. We're yeah. four years down the road and still we're in the last week for ten days that the plan will now not go ahead in the way that Michael Jones promised us at the Parish Council meeting back in July. We sat there and listened to him for 40 minutes and we had just what really turned out to be a load of hot air because frankly, a lot of what he said has turned out not to be correct. He didn't know what he was talking about or he wasn't being honest with us. So the question really for, for me is this. We have a Conservative Council, we have a Conservative Government. I don't see it as Liberal Democrat ministers that are imposing these new rules. It's Eric Pickles, yeah? It's a Please explain. It's combined. No, it's combined. you don't have to get into private politics because it's all Conservatives. So no, no. Well, it's a coalition Please. government, whether you like well, it or not. No, coalition. I don't think it's quite forcing these rules through. That's news to me, unless we've all missed something. But please explain to us exactly Can why we're not in a government. position where the local authority, you're a member of the planning board, Rachel, why are we in this position where we don't have a clear plan again and we're now having another list of excuses? They're not. First and foremost, when I stood to be a borough councillor, I stood as a communicator, and that's what I've endeavoured to do. And when I make explanations, that doesn't mean they are excuses. That is the communication as I either see it or as it either is evidenced. With regard to the local plan, 
uh, meeting here in the summer after the Gladman application came forward, I said then that yes, Cheshire East should have its local plan in place. And the same reason that Stephen has just articulated, that bringing together a plan with, within an authority that has three predecessor districts and half a county means that the history, the knowledge that you build on year on year, on, well, on successive plans isn't in place. You're suddenly in the position where you have to look at the ramifications of development in Disley in comparison to Audlam. Equally, and quite rightly in my opinion, the bar has been raised with regard to the standard of those plans and quite accept that along the way there have been delays with consultations. And ask your local communicator representative, as along with many other councillors on Cheshire East, we have clearly demanded, lobbied, and not been effective, I admit it, for the consultation within the rural areas to take place. I'm now promised that that will be in January 2014, and that again is the uh, circumstance that Stephen has referred to, whereby the local community get to look at its sites. In my defence, looking at John, I will say that prior to the coalition government, I said to um, Audland Parish Council and representatives of the parish plan that if we don't get together a plan whereby we put forward future sites, they will be foisted on them. And as ever, Audland listened and we have a village design statement which um, was put in place to aid and abet that. Um, so we accept that Cheshire East should have its plan in. If it was just Cheshire East that had its plan in, that didn't have its plan in, um, that would be completely untenable for me. But if we look at all the unitaries that were created, they are all grappling beyond Shropshire, as you rightly say, with the same problem. Durham, Cheshire West, Cheshire East. Yes, Shropshire brought their plan in, but the unitary created in Shropshire was a county unitary. And therefore, that knowledge that we've both referred to now was in place. And yet, even in Shropshire, they are now finding that the robust, robustness of their local plan is challenged. And it is about, and I hope that down the line, Cheshire East will have in place its robust plan that will then be able to ensure plan-led development going forward. One final point, with regard to the delivery of the local plan, it's a gradual process. The 12-month timetable is about the plan holistically. The drive in Cheshire East, as it has been in Cheshire West and other authorities, has been to deliver its housing land supply. And that supply comes in the main from sites adjacent to our main towns. Um, and therefore, that's why rural has been delayed. So along, initially, we get agreement of our sites. And then there are additional points to it as well, which include provision for gypsy and travellers, it includes local policies, and then that is when the final document is, is um, 12 months time, is the um, vision for the document to be, to have completed its journey. Thank you. Just, just to summarise that then, does that mean we've got 12 months of being open to speculative developers? The, um, the local plan endorses, it makes the housing land supply figure more robust. <laughs> But last March, Cheshire East announced its housing land supply. At that stage, Michael Jones, as he does, announced that the housing land supply was 7.5 years or something akin to that. And then we um, had the scenario that has been played out in the press where major developers all put a million pounds in the pot to challenge that process as they saw a window of opportunity of bringing forward um, at greenfield sites, which we know are cheaper and less costly for them to develop, to bring those forward. Um, the housing land supply is what didn't pass the inspector's test recently. The inspector said, yes, Cheshire East have a housing land supply of five years, but said, because the local plan isn't in place, that actually means that those sites, may, they may be all over the area, aren't as firmed up as he would want them to be. So the two are together. So in the short term, 
what Cheshire East needs to do is relook at its housing land supply. The next figure will be issued in March 2014 because that runs concurrently irrespective of the local plan, despite the value that the local plan brings to it. So in March 2014, Cheshire East will be looking to announce its housing land supply again. They're hoping to have the piece of work completed early in the new year, is my understanding. Do you not want to speak on this? No, I'll, I'll pick it up in the next one. I just want to know, uh, thank you for your explanation, Ms. Rachel. It's great as usual, and I actually see what's going on. I think the majority of us actually know what's going on. We can't I, I would like to know exactly what you are going to do about it, Mr. Brown, but that's what this meeting was about. Where do you no, come in all this, and what are you going to be able to do about it, Charles? <laughs> exactly. Um, in many ways, I think this is where we've got to be uh, very clear that the power of decision in this is at local level. The power of representation is through the MP and the power of law is with the government. So let's be absolutely clear who can do what. We could have a, we could have a whole hour where basically, and I would be absolutely with you, I'm as distressed as you are about this uh, assail, assail uh, uh, attack on our, our local communities by these uh, speculating uh, developers. The question is what could we do about it at the moment and uh, I'm going to be quite blunt, it's partly answers the question at the front. There isn't a huge amount we can do other than my best advice is to make a lot of noise and to recognise that absent having these processes either in place or with a programme to get there, we have to fight each and every application as it comes along and on its merits. And we have to galvanise the local community, and all of them as ever will do very well in doing that, as indeed have Tatton Hall, as perhaps in some other areas they've not been so able to do. But the point is each and every application, as it comes forward at the moment, has to be fought on current terms. Now, in that respect, whilst I have no power of decision-making, I have absolutely no power of decision-making in, in planning, I do have the power of representation. And I hope that you have seen, both through the... Uh, Audlem Online and indeed through the various letters and the very many uh, representations I've had from Audlem residents so far, that each and every single representation and each and every application that uh, is possible to object to, I have not only objected but also made sure all your objections are taken forward through me as well as those which have been submitted directly. Now that is what currently has to happen. In the meantime, we have to not let up at all in trying to get on top of the process. Because once we get past an agreed process under the Localism Act, we will have a much better, stronger position as the local community to be able to say that application, and apart from us, it would deter most of <coughs> that that application is clearly outside the parameters of what has been agreed as being the best way forward by this local community as voted for in a referendum on a plan which has been approved by the DCLG as a result of it fitting within Cheshire East's approved five-year supply under the system which we and the courts agree is the one to be adopted. So you can see the string of ifs that need to be satisfied on that. As it is, we've been put back partly because of our uh, structural delay and partly because the process has been adopted. And, and let's be absolutely clear, Michael Jones must answer himself. I'm not here, uh, obviously, to answer for Michael Jones, but you know, he is the head of the council. He is somebody who's clearly got to deliver on these processes. And that's what's now currently going through again. And what we must do in the meantime is fight each and every one along the way, but make sure we're also chasing this process. My main answer to you is in addition to looking at each and every application coming through at the moment and marshalling the objections, as I'm sure you would wish to do, it's also as a parish council driving these, getting the local plan in place, driving for the referendum, driving to make sure it's fully compliant, driving to get acceptance. Because that's going to be the template that gives you your best defence against this opportunism, which is beginning to really undermine the sense of community and confidence that I fully understand and I'm, equ I'm equally distressed about. So this is not a, a to and fro between a community and the politician. This is actually to do with how do you harness all your energies and the representative <coughs> electoral mandate that I have to get at both the individual applications and the processes. 
And I, I guess you're about as fed up as I am that this has been an absolute nightmare because of the way we in Cheshire, against all our wishes, have found ourselves in a position where we're powerless to change the fact we are delayed compared to Shropshire and all the others who did not have this loss of corporate knowledge because of the way the unitaries were imposed. And like it or not, that's a fact. Frustrating or not, that is a political reality. I picked up on what Anne Moore did on, on the television last Sunday. And we're very sorry, okay? Yeah, you, it's probably a good thing to do that, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> yeah okay. Um, I watched the television on, on the, the Sunday programme on, on the politics show. And the one thing that we as a village. Can you hear David? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. I'll try, sorry. <clears throat> we as a village are very similar in our position to Tatton Hall, except for one thing. We haven't held the referendum, but we actually have a village plan in place and has been accepted by the local community, but it has not actually been voted upon. If we, irrespective of whether developers try to take us to court or not, if we vote upon that plan, because that plan has been in existence for two years, then surely that falls under the Localism Act, because the Localism Act actually states that if 50% if of the people who vote for a change in what is happening in the community, um, then that, that is approved to go through. Now, I may be paraphrasing rather badly, but it's something I've been looking at about buying land and buying other things in the village and, and then getting acceptance as to what certain things, what things can happen. So I'm now questioning, surely, if we put forward a referendum in this village about the village plan so that it actually has the authority of the village, then that must stand under the Localism Act. As, as the community actually stating very, very clearly what it wants. Well, thank you very much indeed. All common sense would say that you are right. <coughs> I wish I could confirm. <laughs> and the, re and the, reason that I'm, the reason I'm not able to give you the confirmation, which actually I think you deserve, and I would equally agree with you, is common sense. Because you, the village, have worked very hard at that. You've come up with a totally logical and above all, using the word of the Act, sustainable plan for the future. So you're not NIMBYs, you accept there will be some development, you just have to know where it will be best placed and, uh, and, the, and to meet the sort of need required. The difficulty is these local plans, it is very, very carefully set out in the Localism Act, have to go through certain compliance procedures. And so in many ways, you've done all the work. It shouldn't be that difficult to revive a lot of that work. But I have to say, I'm not sure, and let's face it, Tatton Hall, having had the vote, nonetheless, they're still being taken through the courts to try and say that is... And they've, they've been right the way through the process from the beginning, trying to be compliant. Personally, I think it totally stacks up. I think it's an outrage they're being taken to court by these opportunists, but they are being, and we'll have to see what the court determines. We can see from the recent experience in Cheshire East that, despite best efforts, you can be taken to court and thrown out and it came out of you know, left field. You weren't expecting it. So common sense says you're right. But at a legal, compliant, political level versus the vested interests of those who are putting up vast sums of money because they see a fantastic opportunity to be able to build on green fields where they can command premiums for built properties, where they do not want to see the local community having this influence. So you can see how much there's a pushback coming from the vested interests. So don't underestimate the enemy. Oh, don't underestimate um, the enemy. But, but and so my job is to try and help you <coughs> do what you can to be compliant and to get the timetable as advanced as quickly as possible. But and that's what I've been... For, and I've written to Nick Bowles as many times, as many meetings as I can. Um, you know, it, it hasn't worked, I, I grant you. At the end of the day, the law is as it is, and we have still got more of a timetable to complete, and okay. compliance is the issue. Okay. But surely the proof is that the people who vote for it that's the start. Uh, you're absolutely, but if they voted for that, it wouldn't Can be compliant carrying that vote through under the local right? You have to do it again on a differently devised plan. My view is, you've, as the parish council surely will testify, you've done so much work on this already, you're, you're quite a long way along the road in being able to get a compliant plan articulated, put to the people, referenda. So there's yeah. a lady there. Yeah. Uh, 
Cheryl Cooper, Parish Council Member, of Cochrane Wilkesley. My question is, having listened to both Rachel and yourself this afternoon, um, it's becoming <coughs> very clear that neither council nor government can actually be of any help in the situation we currently face. My concern is regarding infrastructure. Mm. The schools, the two local state schools in Nantwich are currently full. With all the planning applications and appeals that are currently going through, and obviously are on recent experience going to be accepted, there aren't going to be places in those schools for children from rural villages because there will be sufficient children within walking distance of those schools in Nantwich. <coughs> Um, to, to fill the places. What I want to know is what the council is cur currently doing to look at the infrastructure <laughs> question uh, regarding secondary education. And secondly, how can we determine that this is a, su a sustainable community when our children who are aged 16 to 17 are having to pay almost a thousand pounds a year to reach their local state school, yeah. their nearest state school. Now, if all these developments happen, what is actually going to be their nearest state school and what's the implication for local parents? Well, I, I, I'll certainly ask Rachel to deal with the issue about the uh, provision by the council. At, uh, I mean, I, I take that question really seriously because just on secondary education for a second, rather than primary, which I'll come back to. On secondary education, uh, it's clear, I mean, I've just had to write a letter in support of Bishop Heber, for instance, uh, wanting to expand its building so it can take in many more pupils because of the very issue that you, you raise. And it's only a few years back that we were dealing with the, what I regard as one of the most outrageous things that ever took place was a TLC um, uh, so-called campaign, which was transforming learning communities when they were closing school places because nobody was taking more than an 18-month view. We could actually see the education uh, population bulge, let alone the housing increase, which was going to do. The issue about schooling is complex insofar as planning is concerned. And whilst you make a totally rational point, the science has always surprised me on this. And the evidence at the moment is that for... Uh, every uh, hundred people you bring into a community, you, you bring one person of school age. It never quite makes sense to me how this works out. No, I, but that is currently... It doesn't make sense, because, of course, what then matters is what type of housing are you dealing with, family housing, entrance housing, whatever. But the current figure they use for planning purposes is this one in a hundred, which I find extraordinary, because it doesn't make any kind of sense to my own eyes and no doubt to yours. But that is currently the planning assumption. So that's the first thing that needs to be attacked. Now, that is something which I've been taking forward and I continue to take forward. But it, it continues to be the rule that is used. So, of course, nobody's really sitting up and taking as much notice of it as you are because they're relying on the rule, and I don't think they should. So far as uh, school planning places is concerned generally, I think the rural areas are really challenged because um, our choices are within county because we happen to be on both a county boundary edge, we have to sort of face inwards to our county rather than actually often the school that will be closest to you is over into another uh, county or regional uh, area, which does cause us particular problems. And as for school transport, uh, well, there will be people in the room who have written to me and know perfectly well I've taken this matter up. I'm deeply uh, angry about the uh, discretion that's been given by government to say it is a matter for local authorities to make the decision whether or not they continue to provide uh, transportation for particular catchment areas which carry rural into their schools post-16. And uh, I know Rachel will want to comment on this because Cheshire East has made a decision within that discretion which is, not, is precisely the opposite of what you would wish and have argued for. Um, I continue to take up that case. I think that if we expect children to stay at school at 18, it has to be right that we should expect them to uh, be able to get there. Um, this is also true of those where they move to special school. I've had this issue for the 14 years I've been the MP for those who choose to send their children, for instance, to a faith-based, a Catholic school, because they take them out of their normal catchment area, they have lost their chance for uh, uh, subsidised transport. Uh, it's the same, of course, of those who choose to send their children to private school 
they have to pay for the transport to get them there. So the, the issue here is whether this is an appropriate discretion to be made, but that's a matter for the council. So I think Rachel should now try and answer your two questions. But, but what you're saying about this ridiculous rule, which is one of the hundred, yeah. taking into account the proposed developments in Nantwich and in the rural yeah. areas, then we're still looking at probably a, 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 an extra school population size coming into Nantwich and the surrounding areas. Because we're talking of what, 1,400 homes in Nantwich? Well, if we and had... those yeah. two schools are full now, and they're not taking out of a crew catchment, they're they taking are. out of they the Nantwich. Well, Rachel will answer this in a minute, yeah. but I think the one thing I will uh, just say on this is you are absolutely right to highlight this issue. It's a political issue, which, you know, for what it's worth, I am doing my best to argue very forcefully at Westminster, is there is a complete um, lag in the time that the schools are presuming that the, the effects of the Localism Act is, is applied equally across the country. And so when you're planning school placements, you know, the amount of school capacity for the future, they're assuming that everything is within Cheshire being... Uh, compliance with the Localism Act, you've all had your referenda, therefore the number of houses per community has been pretty well set out, therefore there wouldn't be the number of houses that you're suggesting, therefore they can see where the accommodation of those extra pupil numbers will be able to go into the schools, either in the current schools or with extra classrooms and extra teachers. And at the moment the planning is basically assuming that when we know the current pressure at the moment, because of the absence of being able to comply with the Localism Act, is that we're getting many, many more applications and therefore the numbers are much higher. So there is, you're completely right, a disconnect. That is a matter of argument, it's a matter of political representation, both at national level, where, as I've discovered recently, there is no discretion within the government, amazingly, to be able to command local authorities to do that. It remains at the discretion of the local authority. And that's where it's up to local authorities to decide how to deploy their resources. And that's where they are. So, Rachel, I think you ought to comment on that. Okay, very briefly, because I'm aware many people wish to speak. Yes, Cheryl, um, completely concur with your concern in the area of education and transport. With regard to capacity for pupils within Cheshire East, and particularly locally, as it stands, there is capacity in both Malbank and Brian Lee's High School, and that was evidenced in the recent... Um, planning reports that went to Strategic Planning Board in relation to Audlem. With regard to transport, again, I can, yeah, there is, com there is capacity in high schools with, within Malbank and within Brian Lees. That's not what the schools are saying. There are figures from Barbara Dale who deals with all the admissions, there is still capacity there. And it is this dynamic as pupils have come into schools and then, for instance, we've known there has been transhumance, if you like, of pupils from the crew area to the Nantwich schools. Um, but as it stands, there is still capacity. Now, these figures are moving all the time and have to be monitored all the time as, as development comes on board. But that was my uh, instruct, that was evidenced in the planning committee report and it was certainly the conversation I had last week with Barbara Dale who deals with admissions. The area where there is pressure is within the primary schools um, and that is acute um, and is of particular concern and uh, in the north there have been school expansions proposed and there are issues in Nantwich in the primary sector as you rightly say. Equally, as Stephen says, it's down to the local authority to monitor that and bring forward proposals for schooling expansions in um, a timely and consultative manner to ensure that that capacity is delivered. It's incumbent on the local authority to do that. And if it doesn't plan well, it equally puts a massive pressure on its transport budget, which is a huge budget. With regard to post-16 um, transport, I recognise how that impacts on rural <laughs> areas. It's a decision that's been taken by Cheshire East Authority. But alongside that, at the Cabinet meeting on the 16th of November, I will bring forward a paper uh, on rural proofing, which will look to put balance into the decision-making that is made and seek alternative ways. The difficulty is, um, for a huge um, borough like Cheshire East is consistency across the piece and in addition to that you will be aware notice articulated many times 
of the shrinking incomes for local authorities. So council tax freeze has been delivered. I support that council tax freeze for the people that are feeling the ramifications of the years of recession. And that council tax freeze has ramifications when it comes to deciding between delivering statutory and non-statutory services. But the rural proofing document is there to try and bring into play some balance. Okay, um, the gentleman over there. Hi, uh, my name's Patrick Cullen. Actually, I'm from Nantwich, so um, uh, I'm going to Mr. Timpson. But um, I take every opportunity to uh, speak to Conservative MPs when I see them. Um, because I do agree with you. We have been battling against that delay that you mentioned previously. And there is a disconnect between planning and the people. You've told us that this afternoon. I've heard Edward Timpson say that. I've heard Fiona Bruce say that. I haven't heard George Osborne say that, but then I didn't go to listen to him. And then there's a chap further up in Macclesfield whose name I forget. But we've got a, a raft of Conservative MPs yeah. who all are telling us exactly the same thing. Now what I would like you to do, and indeed I think the people of Ordland would probably like, although I can't speak for the people of Ordland, is that you should be putting pressure on Eric Pickles so. and telling him exactly, exactly. There's yourself, there's Edward Timpson, there's, there's, there's uh, Fiona Bruce and there's George Osborne. And all the people from the whole of Cheshire East are telling them exactly the same thing. You must, you must tell Eric Pickles what's going on. At the moment, he doesn't seem to know what's going on. Um, because, uh, I, sorry, I, so, I thought you had to be finished. One last thing, one last thing. Because people feel absolutely powerless. Mm. Now you do say, and you're quite right, fight every um, application. The odds are stacked against us, if you well know. Indeed. The odds are stacked against us because developers have almost bottomless pits. From a development near us, they will make 100,000, sorry, they'll make 100 million pounds from one developer. Oh, we haven't got anything like that. We haven't got the time. We haven't got the money, money. And we're running out of energy. We need your help. Indeed. There's only one thing that we've got. We've got the battle. That's all we have. Indeed, sir. So. Well, <laughs> absolutely right. And um, in many ways, one of the areas of powerlessness that you have is actually, and in a sense, I'm not inviting you to, as it were, vote against me, but whoever you voted for, you'd be in the same position. Because actually all the parties are saying we need growth in the economy and the national interest. It would make us feel better. It would make me feel better, <laughs> of course. I understand that. Um, you know, I've, I've stood for re-election enough times to know exactly how you feel. But uh, the issue here is there is a big... The first disconnect is between what is judged to be in the national interest, which is growth in the economy to get us out of the longest recession we've had in peacetime, and it is analysed, not least by one of our local MPs, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, that if you build more and more houses, you deliver growth. Now, as it happens, and publicly, I have been uh, uh, on the record, both to him personally and indeed to other members of the government, uh, I've said that as it happens, as somebody who actually used to be part of the construction sector, you know, when I was helping to run Redland PLC, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that I happen to be the uh, only MP who's ex FTSE 100 director and a manufacturing industrialist. So I know that housing doesn't drive growth. Housing is a reflection of growth in other parts of the economy. And it is exactly because you create confidence in jobs and in uh, the ability to be able to borrow at a price that's affordable so you can afford to take your commercial risk and to address a market to make products available at affordable prices. That is what drives an economy, particularly if you can get exports. Now, that argument, at the moment, I'm completely neither being listened to, and I'm certainly not winning it. The current national interest is defined by all three parties on being, you need to build lots of houses. It is also political by all three parties, because it has been felt for the generations we all represent in this room that to have a property-owning democracy is one which gives a lot of people a chance to satisfy their aspirations in life, 
to take responsibility for themselves, to feel confident about the way they uh, design their own life and lifestyles. That's absolutely also good, and good politics. Where we've got a disconnect, as you rightly observe, is that, uh, and don't, don't hesitate to, uh, to believe that I have had many conversations with Eric Pickles. I'm one of the few people in the House of Commons who comes close to his size. And uh, you know, I am able to have some form of conversation with him without feeling threatened. And equally, uh, I've had many conversations which can be, um, how should we say, uh, a full and frank discussion with uh, uh, Minister Nick Bowles, um, who's made many public comments with which I fundamentally disagree. Uh, and the difficulty there is that they are on a drive to see more houses built. And they do make an argument, which is a good argument, that as an economy, we have had most of our people as a proportion in a sector are employed in the construction sector. So there is a big benefit in keeping house building going because a lot of people then have jobs who then pay tax, which is part of spurring the economy. But there are different things to build. You don't just have to build houses. It's infrastructure. Now, as it happens, I'm against HS2, which is another very controversial thing. It's the reason I did not vote last night in the House of Commons because I don't want to vote against the compensation scheme, but at the same time, I certainly do not want to vote for something where people don't need to get to London any faster and it has no strategic or commercial basis in uh, justification, in my view. Now, that's another big argument. But as an MP, I can be a voice, and you can hear me making the argument as I speak to you in this answer. But at the end of the day, it's one voice amongst a whole raft of notes, and of course a government makes its policy decisions and then seeks to drive it through. And if it can get the House of Commons to vote for it, as it has done with the Localism Act, with the redefinition of the planning guidelines, with now what they hope to be HS2, although I carry hope that we're going to win the day in the end on that one, uh, in my case, I would vote against absolutely every land-based wind turbine because I think they're a fraud on the electorate as well. Uh, I think those things are all where we give a voice and it's up to us to take the argument. So precisely as you argue, take it to the ministers. Now, as it happens, we've got two ministers in our area. You've got Ed Timpson and you've got George Osborne. So the primary argument has to be there. Nick Bowles came up to see and support his fellow minister, Ed Timpson, the other day. I got some flack from... Uh, from here saying, why wasn't I asking Nick Bowles? I said, well, you wait and see what Nick Bowles has to say in Crew and Antwich. I doubt you'll get satisfaction, and I was proved right. The issue is how do you get, how do you win an argument, not just how do you take the argument. At the moment, we are struggling to have any way of winning the argument versus the growth national interest argument. That is dominating. And so the only way to do that is not only just to fight each planning application and to accelerate as fast as we can the process to be compliant with the Localism Act, which will give you more influence, but also to demonstrate that we can generate new economic growth by things other than housing. That is why you know, that will be important. Small business growth, rural industry growth, rural tourism, diversification, these are really important. But then we come up against uh, people saying that we don't want any kind of um, light industrial in our area as well. So you can see where the tensions arise when you're looking at the alternatives to that uh, strategy. And that's what we're up against, is a strategy which inevitably will impact on the rural areas most, because we've got the most attractive, cheapest green fields, and then you couple that, not just with all our Cheshire delays and the problems we've got specifically, but you've got this big money sitting behind developers with a lot of agents in between who come and speculatively try to tempt landowners, uh, farmers who, uh, you know, I would stand up for every farmer, I always have done, but it is difficult when they want to earn off their land twice, both farming and on capital development. But it is tempting when somebody comes along and offers you a lot of money to say, we want to put you in for planning. And you know, they'll go against neighbours, and neighbours will feel tense. That is what we're up against, because the vested interest, they're not just wanting the applications to succeed to build houses. What's worse, if they're listed, they want the land bank in order to boost the share price, even if they don't build. And the one thing that's not yet been mentioned, which is another problem, and that is that, let's say Cheshire East had consented a thousand homes here, but the people who got the consents had only built 25 of them. In terms of satisfying the five-year housing supply and reporting the numbers from council to DCLG, to Eric Pickles, the council could only report 25 satisfied. 950 will have been consented. 950 will be blighting the community. But they don't count towards the housing supply. Now, you may say, why? It's the current position in the law. 
And the trouble is, until the law changes, and goodness knows representations have been made enough on that, we had a debate at Westminster just the other day, in which my voice was uh, prominent, uh, and the word, we'll have a look at it. What are we going to do better than that? And it's just a big battle, and we're really struggling, but we are going to keep going. So that's the best answer I can give you. I wish it was a, a complete answer, but at least you've got the argument. Thank you. My, one of my questions is Straight on the word, so it's quite germane actually, because one of the more laudable things. Michael, sorry. Sorry, here. Quick. One of the better things that Michael Jones did say was that he was very uh, strong emphasising the fact that the houses should be built where the jobs are, which is why he was talking about brownfield sites in Crewe, especially in Nantwich and other areas, and why he didn't want the buildings in all of them. Now, we know that Eric Pickles has made this uh, statement about there will be a presumption in favour of development. Mm. So I believe you actually said, correct me if I'm wrong, there will be a presumption in favour of sustainable yeah, development. Got it, yeah. Please can someone explain to this community how these two current applications could in any way be considered sustainable oh, no. after all the, the comment you've had regarding the health care, mm. lack of, mm. capacity of the skills, etc., sewage, and I'll answer that. I'm also conscious there are people at the back as well. You've had a go. But the, the word sustainable is absolutely key. Sustainable only applies when you're going through the planning process. Once it's been refused, you, know, you can't reinvent that. But I think this word sustainable is key. What's turning out is that what, what's being interpreted as sustain, sustainable seems to be different from you know, what we might believe to be sustainable, i.e. it's a community that can, can shoulder this extra um, number of residents who will have commuting needs, schooling needs, health needs, sewage needs, you know, all the normal amenity needs. And you, know, you, the community, through the plan that was designed earlier, no doubt the plan that's going to come forward, will make a good proportionate assessment of what can be done and what needs more to be done. And indeed, I would argue, through the Section 106 agreements, these conditions you can attach to a planning application which is permitted, I would argue that infrastructure that's required to be added to a community in order to service any added residents should come in first. I know full well from my long experience of dealing with a lot of these things, I think of the new Kingsmead village just outside Northwich, you know, it took us 12 years to get them to build the doctor's surgery, which was on the initial plan, which was part of the temptations as to why that thing was agreed in the first place. And so you need to build the pub and the surgery and the amenity hall in advance. But of course, they tend to be built rather reluctantly, very late in the day, out of the vast profits once they've sold them all. And that means people have found alternative arrangements and the whole generation has gone through without the benefit. So I, I do understand the point about sustainable, and that's another part of the argument. It's an interpretation, but you absolutely are right. The quotation's here. At the heart of the national planning policy framework is a presumption in favour of sustainable development which should be seen as a golden thread running through both plan-making and decision-taking. But, uh, and I see that uh, a representative of CPRE is in the back of the room, in the, um, in the Nick Bowles speech to CPRE in June this year, you know, he said things, which I've got the quotes here, which I hardly dare read out to you, because I could not more fundamentally disagree with him, and I know you don't. And it is you know, about, uh, I recognise that you've been upset by reports of the thing I've said. Um, there is... Um, there's no conflict between preserving what's special about rural England, building enough homes for our children and grandchildren, trying to make us feel guilty. And, um, and then it says uh, we need to build more houses so they become affordable, uh, and not just on Bramfield sites, but in bits of the countryside too. And that's the problem, is that that's where we fundamentally disagree, is that there are at the moment a lot of houses, three or four bed houses, looking for chasing premium sale prices, when in fact I know from having been in the sector and having supplied the building materials in this country and in 35 other countries around the world. The thing that drives the housing market, apart from the economic conditions I mentioned, is actually getting affordable homes in place. Because once you churn at the bottom, it churns the whole market. And everybody trades up as they go through life, as they have families, and then they downsize, is the way it normally works, except for those who have sufficient and they can hold on to large houses at the, towards the, the latter part of their lives. And that is, that is key, is getting the initial housing going but that's not as attractive to developers. And that's part of the problem we've got. The lady at the back. There. Uh, there's a gentleman there. There was a lady here who's had her hand up a long time. Um, I don't really understand all of the ins and outs of the planning. Um, the You're not planning. alone, I can assure you. <laughs> I just really want to say, and I think maybe what lots of us want to say, I came to this meeting hoping to hear 
something that I could do to support yeah. my local community. And I've heard absolutely nothing at all that gives me any heart to go into a fight on this issue. It seems to be all the time there's very little you can do about it. And that, you need to really understand the feeling of helplessness and frustration that that incurs in, in people in this position. And it's not that we don't want anything <coughs> at all more than as you said, mm. we do. We know that there but it needs to be something. <coughs> the location and the type of housing in both instances are completely wrong. And since when was four bedroomed houses affordable homes? And they just aren't. No, I agree They're with you entirely. In that class. And we need more two bedroom affordable homes in those. And we seem to be totally powerless in what we want to do. And this is from a village that has a very strong sense of community. Exactly. That lots and lots of members of the community work very, very hard for the village, including, and I was part of it, the village plan. Mm. And lots of people worked extremely hard on that, gave up their time freely and willingly. And it just seems as though it's not worth the paper it's written on. Well, what I've been well I do understand, and, I, and I'm, con I'm conscious that I'm, I'm not able to throw out a huge n amount of, uh, uh, of opportunities where you can feel powerful about it, or indeed that there's much to be done, other than, please, let me emphasise, until we have gone through this other process which brings you into compliance with the Localism Act, where, yes, all the work that you and many others did, and this community did do superbly, and indeed I was you know, very, very glad to come and we had a meeting like this when it was launched uh, on the previous local plan. That is still valid. The work is still valid. It gives you an absolutely fantastic starting platform for this other work that has to be done in compliance with the new Act. Whether we like it or not, a new Act came forward, partly because there was a feeling that the planning law had become so complicated. Goodness me, as we can see, it's still very complicated. But it, is, it has been simplified. The trouble is, the more you simplify things, the more you give people to chip in at the, at the gaps. Because the whole point about having thousands of pages was at least, you know, it was pretty clear uh, what was possible and what wasn't. By having 50 pages, it gives most things a chance. That is, you know, unfortunately a price of simplification. So I don't want in any way to decry the work you've done, as I thought I tried to answer to the gentleman here. I think it is a great platform. I think the Parish Council, who I know do great work and continue to do great work and a good voice, and all the other members of the community, to use that to, to drive the acceleration of getting a new accepted plan in the compliant format together, which will mean tweaking it a bit and dealing with a few other issues which were not addressed. And we know that because we can see the templates. And we know what Tatton Hall's going through. So watch what's happening in Tatton Hall like a hawk. And particularly if, as I pray, this legal application, and of course I can't comment on legal processes, but you know, a legal application, if it is not successful, great. If it is successful, no doubt there'll be an appeal. But you know, it is going to be really important. Because if they've complied, they've set the pace, they've set the template for all of us around the rest of the area. So that'll be useful, because it means you won't have to go through the learning that they've had to go through. And you can use your existing plan. As far as the other thing you have to be, don't for, at any moment think you should not, however much the gentleman over here from Nantwich said, you know, people are running out of energy. This is no time to run out of energy. Each and every application has got to be taken head on and you've got to fight for it and you've got to petition and you've got to appeal and you've got to make sure the council hear your voice, I hear your voice, we represent, we have meetings, but yeah, each one has to be done. And it's a bore and it's tiring and it's frustrating and you do feel an unequal power against a huge bottomless pit of money that can be at you but at the end of the day there are certain parameters which councillors are entitled to say we don't allow this to go forward providing you're fitting into this definition of sustainable or not providing you can show that this is proportionate or not and and it is worth making the case the difficulty for the councillors and I, i'm not standing here as an apologist for them but i do recognize the challenge, is if they refuse something on grounds which are not seen to be justified, they put the council at risk of costs and fines, which in the end costs us all, because it all has to come off the council tax. And so they're in a cleft stick of only being able to refuse stuff which has got justifiable grounds to refuse. 
So we have to help them uh, get the officers to recommend a refusal so it gives them the chance to have a justified refusal. And we're playing people who are professional and sophisticated and doing this all over the country and know every trick in the trade. So that's why this is, you know, a meeting like today is not because there's a nice magic comfort blanket we can give ourselves. We're in a major fight. We're in a battle here. And it's a nasty one because it's an unequal struggle. You've got people power versus money. That is basically what it amounts to. Plus, you've got voices in the middle and you've got government policy which is driving growth with a simplified planning system, but at the same time, a desire for more political and local engagement. But we haven't yet taken, because we've had a problem, which has not been of our own, we've had a problem getting to the compliance steps. So I'm afraid that's a sort of summary, if you like, of the frustration we both feel. But it won't stop me trying to give you voice. But I can't give you an answer of you, see what I mean? I can't, I can't make the decision. It's not in my power to grant or withdraw planning applications. We have to fight and argue, because that's the process. Can I just add to that before? I know time is going quickly. And if we look at the Cheshire East, um, the result of the three Cheshire East appeals two weeks ago, one of those appeals was dismissed. That was dismissed in All Sager, and it was dismissed over um, damage to the countryside. And within the national planning policy, whilst it simplified the whole process, there are um, pointers there that relate to the um, value of the agricultural land and the impact. And thus far, until that appeal result, the inspectorate had continually said to Cheshire East, no, we're not happy about your ha housing land supply and therefore um, we um, uphold this appeal. The decision at all, Sager, in my opinion, is a glimmer of light with regard to what tools there are for communities, as Stephen has outlined. Yeah, Gentleman at the back, yeah. Yeah, Dave Siddall, the House Council. One of the major concerns that has been raised with these proposed developments is the lack of medical and social care facilities. All the GP surgeries in Nantwich have been be full. The GP surgery in is almost full. Lake Hospital is struggling in A&E to cope at weekends and funding from central government is being reduced. What can you do as our MP to make sure the people of this area have adequate health and social care to cover the proposed increase in population in this area? Thank you. Uh, I think you're right to raise uh, both health and social care. And let us be in no doubt, even if you didn't have any new houses, the pressures are on us anyway in both those areas. Um, on health, most of that is to do with the way health is delivered, uh, because there are increasing um, uh, pressures on the A&E, as you rightly say, at Leighton. Um, some of that is to do with the way we need to reconfigure some of the way the services are delivered. And, of course, as you know, more money is going into health. That is, that's not the issue on health. But there is a massive issue on social care. Those of you who have known me a long time will know that I've been campaigning on this issue of adult social care, elderly social care, uh, for, well, for a decade. And there is some progress. £2 billion is being transferred into the social care budget. You have to remember, of course, NHS is totally taxpayer-funded. Social care is means-tested and is a combination between taxpayer, individual, and local authority funded. So, of course, it has the squeeze on it, as we have a huge, burgeoning elderly population who are living longer, often in need of care, whereas before, uh, death would arrive before the care needs had, had happened. So now we've got a... And particularly this is true of dementia and Alzheimer's. So you're quite right to identify what is a massive generational problem for us to deal with, and we've got to face up to it. Of course, bringing in more people into a local community simply puts more strain on that. I think there is a, um, now, in terms of the pure purpose of this meeting and your question, uh, the issue of healthcare provision and social services for adult social care, which in the past were not, are now, if you can demonstrate on good evidence, a, a good argument, are now one of the grounds for refusal. So that, in a sense, is progress. 
and to some degree addresses your point. Uh, that has, it's just emerging, it's taken a while, but it is now a ground for refusal. The issue is, is a much broader political one, is how do we maintain the way you have access to health services and at the same time uh, maintain uh, the increasing coverage that we're going to have to have for adult social care, particularly for elderly and dementia, which is uh, a massive gener generational shift for all of us. So, um, but take heart that at least that is now a ground for refusal, which it was not. So that is progress. Yes. I had to be up in reception about two weeks ago when on two separate occasions people from Nantwich were actually trying to register here because they can't get in their local practices. So where does that leave the Fjordland community? We refused them because we were out of town. Yes. But if they're starting to come to us already, where's people from this village going? Where do we stand? No, you're quite right. There are pressures, and particularly you can imagine, you take the country as a whole, and health is measured on England, of course, you know, separate in Wales and in Scotland and Northern Ireland each, but uh, there are pressure points with many boundaries. I have particular pressure points because the whole of the west side of my constituency bounds Wales, so they, they have no option even to try and go and register in a Welsh practice because that's simply not possible. And so you can imagine that if the Farndon practice, which from time to time has become very choked, you know, they then go and try and register up in South Chester or uh, in Mulpus, and you can see where, I mean, as it happens, I, my doctor's in Mulpus, and you know, they are pretty full, but not completely full. So they are beginning to accept some of the overflow from Farndon. So there will always be these adjustments to the edges. But you're quite right. If you, you have the discretion in your practice that somebody who comes from out of area you do not have to accept them. It is a matter for you to decide whether or not you wish to do so. You have no uh, obligation to accept them. I mean, it does present problems for the people who are trying to get into the Nantwich practice, and if they can't. And some of this is to do with the, the, the numbers of, um, of people that are being taken onto lists, and uh, you know, you'll understand that as, as well as I do, that, that is a real problem because of the way practices are configuring themselves. Um, some of this is about to change again because there has been a bit of a reaction, as you know, about the way that the, uh, the contracts moved and now there's a, a wish to see much more of a sort of weekend availability for the service as well. So some of this is, is bound to change over the coming year or two. Um, but at, this, at the moment, the pressures are there at local level anyway. Of course, they're bound to get worse if you have more houses, and more people to register. Uh, there is a, always going to be a demographic shift of... You know, children leaving home, going to university, re-registering elsewhere. So you will always have some play at the margins. But if you put a, a volume in, you're going to have pressure. That's a precisely, in a sense, the answer I've just given to the gentleman at the back. And that is why, if there's going to be an unsustainable pressure on local health services, that is a ground for refusal. It wasn't. It is now. So that should give you some... Um, sense of, of fairness that if you can come up with the evidence, and it does need to be good evidence, that you are absolutely at full capacity, which I dare say you can prove, then you need to lob that in, not only via your local councillor, so that the councillor knows that when it comes up or when the officers are discussing a particular application with them or when it's in a public meeting, that point can be made. It becomes part of either something that needs to be addressed by an applicant or it's a ground for refusal. And that often leads to the provision of a new surgery on a plan. Now, that may not be the answer you want, because it means the plan might go ahead. But it does mean that health issues and provisions are becoming part of it. OK, I'm mindful of the time. There's a question from Stephen Morris, who was unable to attend this afternoon. I will just say, though, Jane, with regard to health provision, you'll be aware at the planning committee where the two order recent order applications were considered, there was a statement read out from order medical practice and it certainly resulted in the application that I um, participated in, in a reason for a, rec a second, an additional reason for refusal on the basis of medical capacity. Right, I'm mindful of time. Um, the question from Stephen Morris is, Stephen, there are in excess of 40 properties already for sale privately in Audlam. Several of these are priced below £100,000 and others have been for sale for a number of years. 
Developers are deliberately overlooking existing urban brownfield sites in favour of bulldozing picturesque open countryside, despite them being miles from obvious demand, employment, transport links and school places. Why are speculative developers and landowners, rather than elected council departments, being allowed to shape the future of Cheshire's landscape? I think we have pretty much discussed it, but nevertheless, I felt that when Stephen had taken the time to formulate the question and send it to me, we should, I should share it. Well, he does cover a, a particular point, which we haven't quite covered, and that is, you know, is it relevant how many properties are for sale in an area and haven't sold? We, we've been right through this in Malpas. Yeah. Uh, as you know, Malpas has been a sale, just like Kelsall, Tarvin, Tarpley, Tatton Hall, Winsford. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely assailed by all these applications, and, and all of them no less. But one of the issues we've faced in, in Malpas is that there had been a number of housing developments, 20, 30 homes, that sort of thing. Uh, some of you will know from the old uh, Corbett's Haylage Yard has now been built up uh, around Malpas. And there were a lot of properties, some of them just you know, one, two bed flats, not just the big three, four bed houses, where they were, which had remained unsold. And uh, it was advanced as an argument against the Glabin application there that, uh, that that proved that there wasn't the housing demand locally that would justify trying to attract purchasers, uh, would justify purchases of that quantity in Malpas. To which the answer was, that is an irrelevant factor for the purposes of counting houses. Now, of course, you and I, again, it goes back to common, goes back to common sense. Uh, it, it's, it's part of the determination. But the, the trouble is, these housing demand figures are not because lots of, sort of government officials come talking to people in Audlem saying, what do you reckon is going to be the natural, organic growth of Audlem? What would you think can be sustained? Where do you think the jobs are going to come from? How is it going to be attractive for people... Uh, in their teens, leaving university, taking their first step on the job ladder for people with young families as much as for people who might wish to retire to something which is obviously as strong a community as this. And all that is not going to happen at an Audlem level. Personally, I think it should. It isn't what is happening uh, and it isn't what is proposed. What does happen is they look at the broad figures from each local authority. And so it's what are submitted. So that's why the local authority tries to come up with a plan. It's why, in fairness, most of the housing growth in Cheshire East is around the main conurbations of Macclesfield, of, uh, of um, uh, Crewe, and of uh, Congleton, Sandbach. You know, most of these have got most of the houses. But at a proportionate level, even if you take the numbers which are thought to be uh, what's appropriate, and now it looks as though we've got to find more, under the different system of counting the provision of numbers that the courts required us to look at, is that it feels that much bigger to a smaller community. Of course it does. And that's why the, the proportionate argument is so important. And that's why it's so important. We haven't yet had the test case on this, but I'm hoping that as this word sustainable gets tested, that the word proportionate is part of what is sustainable or not. At the moment, that is up in the clouds. We don't know the answer to that. But that would be a good test case. Now, the only people who are ever going to take these test cases, unfortunately, are the applicants, because they're the only ones with the money. It's unfair to say to a community like this room, if we were really going to take the fight back to a court on an appeal, you know, we'd have to have not just a public meeting, we'd have to have a fundraising meeting, you know, and to fund the sort of level of legal representation, experts, QCs, all the rest of it, and you know that the other side are you going know, to throw everything at it. Uh, you know, you'd have to ask everybody in this room to cough up 500 quid. Well, that's not an easy thing to do or even ask for. So that's why we need to find whether proportionate sits within the word sustainable. But now, that would be a... Steve's question that raised yeah. one out there, it was really, I think the core of his question was the affordability <coughs> of properties, which people like Gladden have used as a justification for building all of them, that it's affordable oh, yeah. properties, which they're clearly not. And they're sustainable. Well, we already have them. I, 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 I hoped slightly to answer that question earlier when I talked about the need for the, for the churn at the bottom. But and when I was, some of their justification. I know, I appreciate it. That as, a, as a reason to get in. And, and of it course, and, and, the, and, and affordable homes is, at the moment, is defined within the way applications take place, that you have to have a, a number within your application that are affordable. Affordability, it seems to me, there is a big policy question here, which is bigger than the timetable you've got. It's a big issue uh, politically. My personal view is that we should retain the right to buy. I think it's aspirational and it's great. But I would say that 
for each one that's sold, we should also then build publicly funded social homes. So effectively, you'd have a replacement. It's a personal view of this. Is it's not either a party, let alone government view, it's certainly not even a Conservative Party view, but my personal view is we should replace every right to buy a home with a socially built home, which is an access home for people to go into on normal social rented accommodation. But the right to buy means that from time to time people will take that, and that's good. That's, that's encouraging people to take responsibility and so forth as their fortunes change. But you should then replace the stock. The problem with the affordable homes quota in private sector developments is it remains affordable at a certain level uh, for a period of time. But then, despite all the regulations that seem to surround this, they somehow slip out of the affordable <coughs> category. Somebody makes a bit more money than they might have done, and it isn't affordable anymore. It's gone into the marketplace. And so you're losing, you're, you're diminishing the stock of affordability which means you're diminishing both the age and the volume of people coming in at the bottom of the market, which is what fuels the whole market in terms of churn, which is actually what you want, is transactions rather than quantum of building. Now, I, I'm sorry if it sounds all rather sort of economic and technical, but the, but the answer is, in a sense, you're right. Steve's right. But the problem at the moment is measuring affordability because there's been this idea of all parties, again, that you don't build social housing anymore, or you don't build council houses, uh, it's housing associations that need to, in a private sector way, build homes. That's causing, I think, a problem of loss of stock. So I have, I have to be honest with you, I have made this pitch very strongly to uh, Boris Johnson's brother, Joe Johnson, who's the MP who's been put in charge by the Prime Minister of the policy formulation for the next manifesto. So whilst you, know, you may have a view whether or not you think manifestos are worth the paper they're written on, um, nonetheless, I'm doing my best to argue this point that I think we should build for affordable stock as, as we sell it. And we shouldn't allow the affordable <coughs> stock to diminish. And the current system is allowing it to diminish. So I agree with the point that's made, but the current system means that we are in a problem area on this. And there is a way to address it, which is my solution. But at the moment, I'm not winning that battle. I'm doing my best to get heard on it. What price would you put on an affordable house? Well, around here, because I mean, it has all got to be relative, not to the marketplace, because of course places like the Lake District and others, they can go up enormously because of people who've got funds for second homes. I think it has to be related to the broad job position and the broad uh, mean incomes. That, that makes sense. So I would like to see affordability for a one to two bed property to be in the sort of 150 to 200,000, which, which is not affordable for most people. Which is, but you can't do it for less. In the days of sensibility, you could come into any building society and you would not get a mortgage for more than three times your annual Correct. salary. Correct. Correct. Uh, annual salary now is, they say, 25,000. I don't know who's heard it though. About 30,000 average. 75,000 on an affordable house. You found me a house other than in Richard Moon Street in Croom. No, I, I, I fully accept that. I, I do accept that. The issue here at the moment, in terms of most people getting onto the property market, and remember in the past, not everybody did, but most people getting the property market is not now the affordability in terms of mortgage, it's actually the deposit. The deposit is the biggest deterrent. Unless you, as a young person, unless you have um, rich parents to help you with the deposit, it's taking people well into their 30s to save the 20 or 30,000 pounds to have as a deposit on a starter home. I mean, this is the biggest deterrent to the affordability of the, of the market. And there are, you know, the right to buy scheme and so forth is beginning to address this. But it's, it's at the moment, it's, it's quite small, small fry. But I, I understand the question, and I don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm not there, I'm all right. Yeah, no, no, and I don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't think £150,000 is nothing. I think it's a huge amount of money. And with three children just leaving home, I really understand it. Well, beyond the means, and this could happen again, of what's happened to them since the recession. I agree with you. You've got thousands of people living in the rough. I agree All with you. Thousands of people being allowed to go beyond the means. You're dead right. You're absolutely right about that. I mean, but, but let's, 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 let's be careful not to stray because that gets into the whole issue about how we got ourselves into this mess in the first place. Be, but it's what they've been allowed to do. You're right. People shouldn't have been allowed to borrow to the extent they did. Not put that in all the we don't want to go down there again either. That's the other point. Um, we are, I'm, a, I'm getting very close to, be, I need to be in Windsor for my surgery at four, and the road at Church Mitchell's blocked. Very so, 
Very quickly, and then a final word from the Chairman of the Parish Council. Uh, four years ago, a small development about half a mile from here, on the right, on the way to Nantwich, went up. And uh, in the end, the developer had to sell to social housing. Why do the developers seem to think Ordnance is such a good place? I mean, not, not much has happened in the last four years, economically. Why, why do they want to put up hundreds of houses? They don't want to the commission, they don't want to build at all. Well, there are, there are some who speculatively want to have the land bank, which is the share price issue for those who are quoted. And there are others who, well, let's be honest, you know, a lot of people would love to buy into the perceived lifestyle of Audley. But this is not a lovely lifestyle by accident. This is because it is a community. That's what this meeting's about. How do we stop the essence of what drives a fantastic community? And you've heard me say it many times before, you know, Audlem, of course you've got challenges and you've got issues and you've got problems like every other uh, collection of human beings. But compared to so many parts of the country and indeed other parts of my constituency, you know, Audlem is a good place to be living. Audlem, you look out for each other. There is a sense of community spirit. Developers are not blind to what sells houses. Developers like to think that by putting a house in Audlem, well, however it might be affected by their doing that, they'd be able to sell as part of their offering, you're being able to buy into that. That's why it's attractive. It's because you are a good community. But we're trying to make sure that's not undermined. That's what this is all about. What's proportionate? What's fair? What can you sustain? That's why this word sustainable is important. It's why having an ability to step up to complying with the plans as laid down by the process of law is so important. And it's why, and I know the Chairman of the Parish Council had his hand up a minute ago, uh, not the chairman, sorry, a member of, okay, I, I apologise for elevating um, the, um, But, you know, that's why it's so important that the parish council particularly, but with everybody else, leads this process of getting going with this, accelerating the process of getting a, a referendum in line with a, an adopted plan that's been approved by the DCLG. That will give you the greatest power to be able to resist this speculative, rapacious approach, which I regard as being fuelled more by greed and an absence of community values uh, than it ever was intended to be. But at the moment, we're in this cleft stick of needing to comply in order to put power back in our hands. Did you want to? Yeah, just one thing. I just want to seek some clarification on what was said about health and being a ground for refusal, which, in fact, it, on both of the major applications that Cheshire East looked at, was taken into account. Yeah. Do you mean just at that um, local council level? Or will health be taken into account at the appeal? Uh, I'll let you answer. I'll come back on the appeal. So if not, is that something that you and your fellow MPs can fight for to make sure that health will be grounds, will be taken into account at the appeal stage? Um, Jeff, certainly during the Heathfield Road Mill Lane application, you will remember there was considerable de debate between the head planning officer and uh, legal mm -hmm. as to whether the reason was sufficient, had sufficient strength to go forward to, the to any appeal if that should occur. And the decision was that that was the case and therefore the reason for refusals included health. Nevertheless, as applications make their way towards the appeal process, the whole case is reviewed and on occasion, I'm not saying this will be the case, but on occasion there can be an alteration to the reasons of refusal. But as it stands, those items um, have been included and I would envisage that they would move forward to um, be justification for refusal at appeal level. Okay. And can, can that then be brought into the appeal? Well, I was going to try and answer that one. Um, if I just try and answer the appeal, it's, um, it's not clear. Therefore, I can't give you the clarification. It's not clear whether specifically that's taken into account. Because when you get to the appeal, as you know, a lot of things can be put forward, effectively the arguments are all rerun. A lot is taken in on paper. But the determination made by the Secretary of State and by, of course, his minister, Nick Bowles, and by all the officials in DCLG who look at all this stuff, and I can make as many representations as I have, but the minute I have either called in an application or the minute I have, and you know, I have to have good grounds for that, it's not always possible to do it. And on the occasions, even rarer, when I can do what's called recover an appeal, 
which is where an appeal has gone forward under the inspectorate uh, channel, that I can recover it to say I, I need that to go to the Secretary of State. And I thought, you know, we'd done quite a good thing on the Nantwich Road application in Tarpley. I managed to get that appeal recovered. It was quite a big deal. And every representation, including the medical, went in. And to my horror and surprise, the Secretary of State, uh, it took a long, long time. I had, I'm not allowed to have conversations, even in the lobby of the House of Commons with the Secretary of State, once you have called it in. He's in a quasi-judicial capacity, and I am forbidden from having a discussion with him. You can understand why, for all the reasons of uh, anti-corruption, which are important and uh, for transparency in public life. So I don't, I can't, but I can send lots of letters in, which is officials, you know, filter and eventually comes up in his red box, and I know it came up about three times, and I know it went back, and I know I was making representations to Nick Bowles, and you know, I was being told it was being looked at very carefully, and then bang, the decision comes out, and they've reversed the inspector who'd said that one should be refused, and they're going to build 104 homes at Nantwich Road. And he doesn't have to give a reason, and he hasn't. Except, he said, I am not persuaded, however advanced Cheshire West has got with its uh, plans, that it's still sufficiently concrete. It is irrelevant that the Cheshire West, across the road, owns a piece of land, the old Brook Farm School, which is equally going to have an application going on, uh, where they're going to be judge and jury in their own application, uh, which could have been a replacement for the number of homes, which by any test will satisfy Tarpley's housing supply over five years. And we're going to allow it because we need to have the homes and we've got to build them. You know, it is really, really tough. And it's deeply frustrating for me, because I want to be able to come back here and give you good news. Of course I do. I'm not an MP who wants to impart bad news, but I'm not going to flan you. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you as it is, this is a big fight. And we've all got to marshal our energies, and we've got to be really specific about until we get a compliant localism plan with your referendum in place, on a plan that satisfies more than the one that's already been done, brilliant as it was, and until we actually get that in place to have some better influence over what we think is appropriate for here, which developers will therefore have to take account of, we are up against all these applications and we're up against the fact they will try and leapfrog the timetable by often saying, we don't want to wait for the determination of the council, we're going straight to appeal and we'll go for the inspector. Because it puts them ahead in the queue whilst they think this window of opportunity, which has been created by the delay that Cheshire has had thrust upon it by the unitary problem. Uh, you know, it's a window. So we're in a really big fight of opportunism and this window versus what we are trying to do to get ourselves compliant with what, in broader terms, has been the intent, which is to give the Localism Act real, real legs. So the answer is, medical may or may not be taken into account, but you know, my most recent experience is, has been very discouraging, and I have to be honest about that. Um, can I take these two together, and then I'm, I think, in, in fairness to the constituents who will be queuing at Winsford, I'll, I'll need to, to get there, because as you know, the road's closed at Church Mitchell. So take the two together, and I'll answer. Past council of 32 years for this parish, special interest in planning, chairman of it twice. And as well as depressing thought for you, while I was on the council, every appeal ran forward and been applied to. So I don't think this is the first or the last. And uh, as you say, you can't do a lot about it, but you have a vision. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Stuart Sauer, all the residents, and um, you've spoken quite a bit about marshalling our energies and kind of focusing our energies. What, what would your advice and guidance be, and what steps can we realistically take in order to get the best representation that we can get? These um, controversial applications are clearly one is at appeal, and I'm sure the other one will go to appeal. Yeah. What, what is the best, the soundest advice you could give us? Well, I think it absolutely does help to do it on the many fronts. The first is uh, numbers count. So it is worth raising petitions every time, even on appeal, re-raising the petition. It is worth, with bundles of paper, lots of addresses, particularly local addresses, it's no good going off to Stoke on Trent, which is something to try and boost the numbers. Um, and, and make sure you not only present that to the council, but to the inspector, to me, we find photo opportunities, so we get a noise as much as we can on each application going, which is what we've been doing here and elsewhere. That sets a tone of a context for the developers, who, let's face it, don't care that much about it, but it matters enough for there to be some corporate reputational risk that they're really putting themselves offside, a local community. And it starts a 
potential, doesn't guarantee it, but it does start a potential negotiation process at least. Secondly, in working with the parish council as energetically as you all can to find out what is it you need to do with the current existing local plan to get it into compliance status, where are going to be the issues, i.e. where are you going to have the local arguments amongst yourselves about which fields might be in and which fields might be out. I mean, let's face it, the whole point about these local plans is because there will be some winners and losers. There will be some people who had always thought, oh, I'm going to get my pension out of that field one day, and they're never going to get the chance. Mm-hmm. And there are going to be others who uh, happen to have a field which is absolutely right for development, but it's next to a whole lot of people who've always loved that field and walking the docks, and they're going to be furious. And, you're going to, and the whole point about the Localism Act is, frankly, you've got to sort that out amongst yourselves. Neither the government, nor me, nor the councillors can do that. That is what that plan is about. It is to resolve local arguments and to take the responsibility upon yourself. Not easy, because somebody will be unhappy. That's the way it is. And it helps by starting with the council being able to tell you what number of houses over what period of time you should be providing for. And that is what, in fairness to the council, they've done their best, but they actually found the court, got kicked, mm-hmm. kicked them out, and now they need mm-hmm. to base it up it a bit. But broadly, you know the scale of what you've got to find. It's about how many here? 70 now over 20 years. 70 years over 20 years. It doesn't feel like that. It feels like, you know, 70 every six months at this rate. So, you know, we've got... So once you get that plan together, and I think the parish council has got both a massive <coughs> opportunity, but let's face it, a massive responsibility to marshal this together, and so yet again, all of them's got to find all that volunteer effort to do it. But I think that's... To, but then, you know, the whole point of my being here today is not because I'm going to flounder you, and not because I thought it was going to be an easy ride, and it hasn't been. Um, it's because I'm here to be an instrument for you to use as a voice. What I can't do is stand here and be accountable for decisions over which I have absolutely no power. With you, I am powerless. I'm going to picking up the word from the lady who's left. And absolutely... You know, I'm as frustrated as you are, because I... Look, let's face it, I don't want Aldham to be plastered with houses. You know, I like Aldham just as much as you do. I happen to live in Horton. It's not dissimilar. We've had to face the Ecotown onslaught from Wardle, which came our way. You know, we've got exactly the same problem. So, it's a massive challenge for this area, and we've really got to try and make sure that uh, we all marshal those strengths together. So that's the answer. Use me as a voice. I can't provide a solution. I can't provide an answer, but I can certainly be an instrument of noise. And I can make the, uh, and I can make, and I can make the argument in Westminster for those policy issues. But they're longer term. Yeah, that's not going to solve your immediate challenge. But it's worth. I've got to make the arguments because that's what we're about. I mean, in the policy terms, that's why politicians exist. It's because policies are choices, and you have to make those choices. At the moment, I think a lot of the choices are wrong. I mean, I'm doing my best to try and change the direction. Just to follow up on the subject of Westminster and, and government policy for the whole country. Yes. In this area, well. The thing that a lot of us don't understand is how many is too many. And is there not a danger that if this is allowed to get out of control as it is doing at this moment in time, in 10 years' time we're going to have so many unsolved houses right across the country, maybe some here in Northern, that we have ghost estates, we have a potential depression of the housing market because there's oversupply. What, what's the thinking? I don't understand what Eric Pickles is thinking is it's not clear to me as a member of the public. Well, it's not clear to me either. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and to be blunt with you, I don't think thinking has got anywhere near along those lines at all. At the moment, the I've, not, I've, I've, I've not sat around the Cabinet table, but I imagine what's happened around the Cabinet table is they've said, you know, steering the ship of state is difficult enough. We can tilt it a bit of it, uh, one way or the other. We might have some effect. You, know, you expect them to have an effect. After all, it's the government. But actually making things happen is always a big challenge and working through the whole system and all the rest of it. And they've said, unless we focus on the one thing we want to achieve, we're not going to get anywhere. And so it's basically been that if you're a minister in the government at the moment, it's certainly been true you know, since I left it, frankly, uh, for the last year, the only word you hear every minister say, and if you were to invite a minister here, whether it's Nick Bowles or any of the others here today, if you had George Osborne standing in front of you today, as a local MP... He would sort of, no doubt, be sympathetic, but he would only use one word in answer, growth. Growth, 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 growth. That's the strategy. And this is regarded as delivering growth. Now, I've given you my argument, and you know where I stand on that. But actually, at the end of the day, I'm just a voice on that. I'm not winning that argument, because I don't think house building drives growth. As I said, I think it reflects good growth, good good confidence in the economy. And so I think that's a, another argument, but it's not, again, it's not going to come to the rescue for, to you today. 
So, and, and of course, you know, if Rachel's making the point in my ear quite rightly. I mean, the truth is, you haven't got a, it isn't as though you can run across to another party and get a different agenda. It, you know, you that everybody's on this agenda because they all realise the recession was so awful and the bulk of the population want to feel better and have more money in their pockets. It's a bit like a quick fix and that's not the answer to me. So, you and I both know that, but we have to take the argument. It doesn't solve your immediate problem of applications, of appeals, of you know, suddenly seeing. Because once that field's built on, it's built on forever. You can't have it back. That's the trouble. That's the immediacy of it. And these arguments are for the long term. So much as I'm prepared to have them, and I make them, I've tried very hard today to be specific about the current challenge we face, which is why I leave you with the message that I'm grateful for the chance of having had, had what I hope is not just a one-way sort of spouting. I hope there's a sense of dialogue. But above all, don't be under any illusion. I really hear your concern. I really do understand it. As it happens, because I live in the area and I live the same sort of approach to you as a community life, I do feel it. But I'm also realistic, and I'm not going to flounder you. This is a tough battle, and we have to fight each application on its merits. We have to accelerate our compliance with the Localism Act. We have to drive and support our councillors in being able to have the argument with the ECLG to get those numbers accepted, to overcome this court setback, so we need to drive it forward, and we need to work collectively, because no one person's got an answer or power to do this. We have to work collectively. And above all, get that plan in place, because as soon as you can get out there, once you've even got it agreed, it has to go for approval, it has to then go further for approval, and then there's a statutory period. You can't have the referendum in a week. You have to wait a period of time, don't you, before you qualify to put it to a referendum. So you know, you're into a statutory timetable. So the sooner you get it in place, the sooner you can get going with the timetable, the sooner you will have a better answer. So, and in the meantime, I'll do everything I can to support you. But I can't promise I've got an ability to give you the solution. I have got the ability to give you a voice. Stephen, thank you for giving us far more time than your diary really allocated and thank you everyone for attending for your questions and also for the manner in which you've put them forward and listened. It's very much appreciated. Well done. Thank you.